is uh, challenges and progress in the war on terrorism. And uh, whatever your image is under the rubric of war on terrorism, uh, those various concerns and problems are, are with us. And it's always uh, helpful and important to assess and reassess what we deem challenges and to assess the progress that we make in, in coping with these problems. And we're delighted to be brief, so to speak, on that tonight. And certainly the president-elect will be briefed intensively on this problem that's not going away, uh, the questions involved in the war on terrorism. Uh, Ambassador Daly uh, served for 36 years in the U.S. Army, rising to the rank of Lieutenant General while he was director of the uh, Center for uh, Special Operations. Uh, he uh, has worked in that area for a long time within the military, um, starting with Desert Shield and continuing all the way through uh, various Middle East operations up through uh, uh, Iraqi freedom. So his experience was long in that particular area. Within that particular responsibility, he not only had to deal with the military questions, but try to integrate all the resources of American foreign policy. And now, in, since uh, June of last year, he's been coordinator uh, for counterterrorism uh, in the U.S. Department of State. And as such, uh, he's charged with coordinating the development uh, and implementation of U.S. Uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis terrorism uh, overseas. And that, of course, will involve working with a number of, of other agencies as well. In addition, he plays a role in developing the strategies through which uh, we cooperate with other nations in that same war, and he's charged with securing their cooperation. So he's been at the center of, of questions of counterterrorism for a long time, and he's in a pivotal position now in Washington. Uh, we're delighted and uh, honored to have him with you. I'm glad to present uh, Ambassador Del L. Daly. Frank, thank you very much for that uh, reception to the entire team here. I'm looking forward to expressing the uh, U.S. government's perspective on counterterrorism and we'll make it somewhat brief so we can capture the questions which are usually far more penetrating than the formal presentation. Uh, I pride myself in being an Army helicopter pilot, and when we flew at night, we were night stalkers. Uh, we would go through our intermediate checkpoints at plus or minus two minutes, and we'd hit the objective at plus or minus 30 seconds. I've used that standard for the children in my family, all five of them. <laughs> But I failed that standard tonight. <laughs> so my comment to the team here is that I'll be at your beck and call as long as you want. Tonight and into the wee hours tomorrow, Frank, as you see fit. Okie doke. Uh, it is very uh, uh, fulfilling for me to have gotten the invitation to come here because most of my work is on the international side. I'm kind of like the individuals who come visit with you from Israel and from Indonesia, but I do that uh, uh, around the world. So an opportunity to do diplomacy in the domestic arena is a little out of our realm, but absolutely essential, particularly now with our change in government. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the United States government counterterrorism model, and then I'll give you some of the structure that's in the government to uh, make that model successful, and then open it to you for penetrating and painful questions. <clears throat> if you take the triangle like this and visualize the top third and that mission in there for us in the counterterrorism world for the U.S. government is capture or kill leaders of the terrorist activity. Now, it's not kill or capture. It's capture or kill because we want to capture them so we can interrogate them, and get as much information out of them as possible. That's far more rewarding and far more uh, helpful to the overall war on terror. Now, that's normally done by the CIA and also by our law enforcement agencies 
those embedded inside DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, and FBI. They have lead. The State Department has support. If you want to quantify the level of effort, it ought to be something like about 15 percent. But it captures a lot more excitement in the United States because that's our nature, is aggressiveness, moving out and going after the leaders. Can't quite get them, we'll kill them. Movies are made up of it. Books are being written about it right now. There is actually a couple TV series about our organizations that, does, that do that in a classified manner. So the killer capture part up there is pretty important. It goes after leaders. It's 15% of our effort, and guess what? All it does is buy us time. It does not solve the terrorist problem. So let's take that triangle we mentioned. Let's go down to the center portion here. In that category, that third there, we identify as disrupt. And there's nine general areas inside the disruption portion that we want to exercise our disruption skills on. Disrupt finances, disrupt travel, disrupt training, disrupt communications, disrupt logistics, several others. The culminating one, though, is actually not disruption, but we put it in that category because it's so powerful. And it is counterterrorism legislation. Because that brings to our partner nations around the world the rule of law and good governance. It also lends a powerful legitimacy to what that country is doing. Now, that counterterrorism legislation is inside their culture, inside their laws, inside their history. We don't try and work U.S. legislation on top of that. Who has lead in the disruption portion? About every agency in the U.S. government. Homeland Security has got uh, border control. Obviously, CIA has travel and FBI has travel. Treasury has uh, finances. Every one of our cabinet-level offices and our separate agencies have a certain portion of disrupt. State, when it's overseas, has the whole kit and caboodle. And we coordinate that through our chiefs of missions or our ambassadors that are in those foreign countries. So the chief of mission authority is pretty powerful, and it ties together all of the executive branches from the United States in those countries. And it is unforgiving. If you want to come in and work in that embassy, you have to work for the ambassador because he has a country team perspective. And frankly, it's working pretty good. What's the level of effort there? Probably about 20%. So our effort, 15% in the top uh, capture or kill, 20% in the center for disruption. And oh, by the way, that also doesn't stop terrorism. It also just buys us time. So let's look at the bottom of this triangle now. Bottom of the triangle are those areas that the terrorists take advantage of to build their organization. And we call that, for want of another word, and from the Vietnam era, the hearts and minds of the potential terrorists. And the hearts and minds of those folks who support potential terrorists or their organizations. Five categories. Social inequity, lack of political integration, economic unfairness, religious persecution, and finally, ideological extremism. Now, this bottom of that triangle is right where it should be. It's the foundation of counterterrorism. It does, in fact, stop terrorism. The other two buy us time so we can implement activities in those five areas to take away those characteristics that a terrorist uses to their advantage to build their organization to identify future terrorists. About 60% of our effort ought to be in the bottom of, that, uh, bottom of that triangle. It is the most difficult of all of those to do. It takes time. By the way, it takes a lot more money, too because you're building economies in some countries or in counter-terrorist vulnerable areas in those countries. And we're working for social reform. We're trying to get religious reform. So those are pretty challenging inside the countries. Once again, that falls on the ambassador that's out in the field. 
Now, there's a couple cross-cutting aspects that go all the way through each of the three portions of this counterterrorism model. The first is we've got to do this as a team with the partner nations. We should never, ever, ever do it unilaterally. And if by chance we do, we figure out how that message to that country is so persuasive. They may not have the capability or they may not have the will, but we'd persuade them that the unilateral action was absolutely essential and in most cases was a direct threat to the United States. But as a rule, we want these to be with our international partners. The second cross-cutting aspect of this, of this model is that they all have to go on simultaneously. You can't do capture, kill at the top, then work on the d disrupt portion, and then finally, four or five years later, start working on the bottom. They all have to be going together. And the killer or the capture kill part keeps taking the leadership out. They keep putting in less, more people from the bottom. They're probably less trained, less qualified, easier to pick off if we want. The disruption prevents them from doing things, from either travel or, or uh, train or recruit. Then the bottom portion takes away their recruits, takes away their folks that are actually going to build that pyramid. So that's my first comment uh, of my, my pitch tonight. But one last aspect on this. Did you hear me say anything about Muslims? No. This model fits terrorism for whoever presents it to the United States or other countries. Okay, uh, second part is what's the structure that we have to kind of implement our terrorism activities? In the State Department, my office has got 100 folks uh, established in 1972. State was visionary, really figured out terrorism is going to be a, a problem for the long haul. And we have about a $250 million budget that trains other countries, police forces, law enforcement, and uh, financiers, treasury individuals, and legislators, how to do counterterrorism in their countries based on their morals and the culture. Uh, my office is, my position is political. I've got some very, very influential foreign service officers in my team. My, my deputy is a former ambassador, seasoned, skilled, and successful. In the military, his rank is equivalent to three stars. And then we've got four other uh, deputies, three females and a male, all foreign service officers, all very, very talented. And then there's the rest of the team as it sprinkles down. Department of Defense has a counterterrorism entity also. It's called Special Operations Command. Department of Justice has a Special Operations entity. The person I deal with there is Bruce Swartz. Department of Treasury just today uh, announced a uh, financial restriction on, uh, on Iran. They also have a counterterrorism entity there. So within key departments in the United States government, there are counterterrorism equivalents. We meet every Monday, 12 o'clock to 1.30, in the White House Situation Room. We see a threat lay down, which is the enemy around the world, who's doing what to the respective nations and the United States. And we also go about what policies should we do to try and uh, defeat that threat. That's the U.S. government's counterterrorism entity. Now, outside the U.S. government, counterterrorism is important also. So there are many countries involved in counterterrorism. The best multilateral organization or structure out there that goes after counterterrorism is none other than United Nations. Pre-9-11, they had in place uh, a Security Council resolution against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They were that insightful. Post-9-11, they implemented what's called designations, 1267 designation. That's the acronym that identifies their resolutions. That designation process, once it passes through the Security Council, compels all of the states to implement counterterrorism activities against that organization or that individual that's been so designated. So what that does is it freezes their assets, prevents international travel, and compels the country, if that individual's in their country, to uh, affect a, a pickup. That's pretty good. It also has an implementation committee to make sure that the countries and the states follow the 1267 designation process. So it's pretty good. If 
For an organization that's multilateral with every nation in the world, there's sometimes there's hiccups in the process, but they figured it out early and they have an implementation process to uh, pursue it. There are other multilateral organizations around the world, but not quite as penetrating as the UN, that do certain things. APEC, ASEAN, OAS, the EU, they all have some form of counterterrorism entity Im embedded inside them too. I deal with them. In most cases though, those entities are concerned about mustering funding to train their country and their multilateral country members in better law enforcement or border control. My last point is, where are we right now? Well, since 9-11, there hadn't been an attack on the United States. The administration's philosophy of push out the borders, push out the terrorists away from the United States, frankly, has been pretty successful. The challenge has been, though, that we push people coming after the United States into the countries that, in a lot of instances, are our friends. And the United Kingdom is a pretty big example. They've had an attack in 05, 07, 06, and 07. Pakistan, another friendly nation to us in many ways, has also been a throughput uh, either to the European countries, to UK, and in some instances uh, in reporting possibly even to the United States. So our philosophy has been to push them out. We've been successful. The establishment of the, of the Department of Homeland Security, border control into other countries, no longer does a terrorist come to the United States and the last thing he sees, correction, the first thing he sees is our border control. We want that to be the last thing he sees. So our agents and officers are out in their embassies around the world. We're stopping them out there. Now there are some hiccups. There are some problems. Al-Qaeda's got a very powerful media machine. We've got some constraints for privacy and individual rights in the United States that prevents us from going after them. They also have occasional successes. They bombed the Marriott in, uh, in Islamabad. I was in Islamabad uh, about three months ago. The first night I was there, they bombed a hospital. The second night I was there, they made an, uh, an effort on a US uh, official. The fourth night I was there, they bombed an emission plant. 60 people killed, over 100 wounded. Then later on, after we departed, the uh, Marriott got hit. So it's not all rosy. We do have some hiccups and some challenges around the world. Algeria also has become under the gun by an Al-Qaeda Al uh, affiliate. But we're doing pretty good also in the sense that that hearts and mind business, the Grand Mufti in Spain issued a fatwa against uh, terrorism. The Grand Mufti in Egypt did the same thing. The Grand Mufti in Saudi Arabia also did the same thing. We're getting now, in the effort with Al-Qaeda, we're getting now the Muslim population uh, who have become aware that this is a detriment to them. The Al-Qaeda effort is killing innocent Muslims, and the Muslims main, mainstream realize that, and they're far less receptive. Pakistan, the approval rate uh, went from 33 to 4% for bin Laden, a 40% uh, to 9% in Saudi Arabia. So we have some successes where? At the bottom part of that darn triangle I mentioned to you earlier on. So uh, in conclusion, both uh, presidential delegations were briefed by the National Security Council on counterterrorism during their campaign. We do expect more emphasis from the Obama team as we move into, the, into their transition and ultimately into, the, into their position. I'm prepared to answer some questions on how we think they will affect things. We have a little bit of indication. But I'm also prepared now to answer uh, any other questions that uh, may come from the field. And, and, and am I in charge of the question control board, Frank? <laughs> Okie doke. All right. Uh, I'm kind of a little bit of a glare here, but uh, anybody who's scratching their nose, that means there's a question. Yes, sir. Let me repeat the question. Uh, Secretary Rice is on her way to Israel. The underlying uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, confrontation for as long as it's been in place, if we could solve that, would that help us around the world in the counterterrorism uh, business? Absolutely. It is used uh, by many nations as indication that uh, 
we're not as serious about terrorism as we should be. It is put on the table as help fix that, and we'll put uh, another uh, 37 or 47 pro-Israel countries into the, into the UN. So absolutely it's important. Uh, Secretary Rice is following the guidance from uh, President Bush. There are other initiatives that we're trying to uh, pull together. Candidly, we probably won't get them uh, pulled together before the uh, uh, administration change. My expectation is that, the, is that the new administration will look at that as a very important tool for peace in the area and also for taking out one of those portions in the bottom of the triangle from political uh, uh, lack of political inter integration to the ideological struggle as a cornerstone for uh, counterterrorism. So absolutely, it's, just, it's very important. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wow, there's two questions in there. My rule is only to take one of them because I forget the other one. <laughs> the, uh, the first question was uh, moving troops out of Iraq. Is that a prudent effort? And the second was, what do we think the, the new administration will do coming out of the starting, uh, starting blocks? I got a boy on the way to Iraq. Uh, I'm prepared to see him go do his duty. He leaves into this month. So uh, the effort of taking folks out of there is tied to the conditions that warrant that. In the most important part of Iraq, the El Ambar province, which is a Sunni-generated area, we won the hearts and minds. Al-Qaeda lopped off heads, cut off hands, made themselves so hated by the Sunnis that the Sunni tribe, tribal uh, leaders said enough's enough. And they came to the United States saying, help us get rid of these folks. So El Ambar is what we call the El Ambar Awakening. We truly got the hearts and minds there. And that unseated a lot, or un, 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 unseated a lot of the uh, uh, challenges almost all the way through uh, Iraq. Yes, uh, al Mahdi or the uh, Sadr folks, stopped fighting against the, against the U.S., although they, they gravitated in the political arena, which was a much more uh, uh, acceptable form. So in the scheme of things, the conditions are being met. It probably is appropriate to draw down. By the way, we don't have much say-so. The Iraqis want us to move out somewhere between the 2011-2013 time frame. Uh, the second question, where, where do we see the new administration moving? Uh, they, they got some uh, uh, areas to wrestle with that Frank mentioned early on the financial economic side. But um, they'll be able to do a lot of things simultaneously. And that structure that I mentioned to you has got some people embedded in the National Security Council. The, that meeting that we have every Monday is run by a National Security Council member. I'm sure they'll look at it from a couple new perspectives. Uh, I'm sure I, I suspect they will. One is uh, we've unfortunately with this administration kind of gotten the impression that we, we were moving out kind of more of a unilateral mode than as a team. That may be perceived improperly because there's a lot of teamwork going on, but I think this administration, the new one coming in, will try and tackle that perception right off the bat because it's a bad perception for our team members around the world. Uh, there might be some legislation that they uh, move into, but most of all, if you listen to Secretary Gates from the Department of Defense, he's saying, oh, wait a second, I, I, I got a, a huge budget and I'm doing an awful lot of stuff, but I don't have any authorities. Wait a second, over here on the State Department side, they've got almost all the authorities in foreign countries except for two, Iraq and Afghanistan. Those belong to the Department of Defense. All the other countries are, are run by the Department of State through the ambassadors. Uh, he is saying, let's balance the budget a little bit more to do the soft side of counterterrorism. So I suspect that this new administration will heed Secretary Gates's insight. Certainly, Secretary Rice has been saying it. Now Secretary uh, Gates is saying it. So we'll probably see, uh, and not necessarily bounce with the Department of Defense, but a, but a, little, a, a little bit more increased ability to do the, the bottom part of that triangle. Okay, how about over here, please? Yes, sir. How do we handle uh, um, terrorist situations where they bounce back and forth between borders and use political uh, safe havens or political sanctuary as protection? You have to work with both countries, the receiving and the giving. You have to ask them to control their border. You offer up U.S. military, special operations folks who show up there, who speak the language, know the culture, go on both sides of the border to assist. Many countries are not receptive to that because it, their sovereignty is, is their pride and they don't think that this, in most cases, necessary. Sometimes they're done subtly. 
There's also a very powerful connection through the intelligence services to assist by providing intelligence. So-and-so just came across the border. Our national assets see him or hear him. He's at this location. Hey, receiving country, here's the latitude, longitude. We think he'll be here for the next six days or 16 hours or whatever. Then, of course, there's a long-term solution in the receiving country to try and fix those things that allow that terrorist organization to be drawn to it. So those are the techniques. Sometimes countries have the will but not the capability. Sometimes they don't have the capability or the will. And finally, there's some who just don't have the will. So uh, it's a diplomatic action, it's a military action, it's a law enforcement action. And it's, uh, it's, once again, using all of the elements of national power. Yes, ma'am. Um, winning hearts and minds around the world when we violate uh, our own laws through tol torture and, and other activities. Uh, post 9-11, we tried to keep our interrogation techniques inside an ill-defined law. And I think the term was... Uh, uh, illegal combatants. And that terminology uh, was untested. And it went through the system uh, and got captured with situation in Abu Ghraib. Now that Abu Ghraib is pretty important and the facts are critically necessary to be on the table. What was taking place there was not discovered by the media. What was, be what was taking place there was discovered by the United States Army. And there are already administrative and judicial activities to stop and counter that when it got into the media arena. So in the rule of law business, the area was undefined. Certain things we saw that were going wrong that we tried to stop. So we now are in a more mature stage. Our laws on interrogation are far more defined. Our laws on surveillance Domestic and international are far more defined. And we're inside of all those right now, and they're withstanding judicial scrutiny. And we are a nation of laws and rule of governance. And that's an example of it. Next question. Um, taking individuals across international borders and giving them to other countries that may use different uh, interrogation techniques than we. A lot of countries, um, a lot of individuals we pick up around, around the world are not U.S. And to some extent, we're trying to end our situation in uh, Guantanamo. But these individuals have their own country. So we approach those countries on taking them back. The challenge is are those countries going to follow as close to what we want them to do and not move to torture? The answer is, if they don't, we don't send them back. Uh, and if they do, we want measures where our uh, legal attache can see the individual on short notice so we know their condition or, or whatnot. An example is, are the hundred folks that are from Yemen in Guantanamo. Um, we're not sure they'll get a fair treatment in Yemen, so we haven't released them back. There are other countries in the same situation. Our challenge is we go to a third country, a th third party, and say, would you accept this individual? In a lot of instances, they do, and others, they don't. That's why Guantanamo is... I think at 250 folks now, and it went down from about 600. That's not the rendition question that I think you asked, though, but I think that's the essence of what we're trying to do to get the people back safely uh, and in the, uh, an appropriate country. Yes, ma'am. I couldn't have planted a better question. <laughs> the question is, uh, would we like to implement a Marshall Plan in the uh, Arab Israeli or the uh, Israeli Palestinian situation to, like to do uh, let me let me finish, ma'am. 
and, and try and take away the challenge that uh, we have with that area, and will I do something about it? Once again, yes. And second of all, yes. Uh, I'm on a group that has taken the area of Janine in Israel and put security, well-trained external security, Palestinians that were trained in Jordan, about 500 of them, into the Janine area with cooperation and coordination with the Israelis. And it's turned out to be remarkably successful. I didn't generate that idea. I joined the team after that idea was established and moving along. Now, the security aspect in Janine is just one part. There's good governance that's necessary there. There's also economic development. Good governance is going to be under the uh, control of the EU, and economic development is going to be under the control of Tony Blair and great donor nations. Those two are probably not working as fast as we'd like, but the security part has. We are interested, along with the Israelis and the Palestinians, to move further south with that uh, concept of Palestinian-generated security in the area. Now, uh, it's not anywhere near the magnitude of the Marshall Plan, but USAID and public-private partnerships are incorpor incorporated into that plan. So uh, although I'm not physically the person who conceived and put it in place, I'm with a team that is uh, moving that along, and that team is embedded in the State Department, and that team has been to Israel, and Israel has been to the United States to further those objectives. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll go with the first, the first question, is different between freedom fighter or terrorist? Terrorist uses fear, murder, all kinds of active techniques to intimidate other people for their political gains. So there's a use of fear for a political objective. Freedom fighters is an acronym where in some instances they're pure and, and uncompromising, devoted towards getting the nation that they're inside moving in the right direction. Other times, they may use terrorist-like tools. So we have a confusion with the, the term terrorist and freedom fighters. It's very passionate in a lot of the nations. And it's the primary cause why we can't get a UN definition of international terrorism because we have the wrestling match with foreign fight or freedom fighters and terror, uh, terrorists. Um, golly, what was the second question? I forgot it already. The second question was, how do you measure whether the yardstick for measuring success? Sure. Uh, the United States uh, Department of State every year sends out a notice to all of its 169 embassies and consulates saying, this year we have a, for want of another word, a questionnaire to fill out. What is the country you're in done with regards to apprehensions with regards to counterterrorism legislation, with regards to uh, funding certain uh, uh, radicalization and de-radicalization programs. We send that out. My office sends it out. We got it back last year for, for 07. We're starting the 08 right now. We assessed in there that the uh, international terrorism had gone down. And if you take out Iraq and you take out Afghanistan, which are almost combat arenas where they, but they use terrorism, the numbers do show a drop. What we're trying to do in this year's report on terror, uh, country report on terror, CTR, what we're trying to do this year in Iraq and Afghanistan is say, for those military operations that are taking place, delete those. The ones that are raw terror include those, and we think that'll give us a more accurate number. Now, we're pretty proud of that report because it's, it's objective. It goes out every year. It has some subjective angles into it, but it's, it's pretty good. It's available on the, uh, on the internet. Just shoot up for, uh, hook up to the State Department, go for the uh, country reports on terrorism. But about five months later, then four-star general uh, Mike Hayden, the CIA, said terrorism's going down. So you had two separate assessments that took place. Now, by accident, state was first, or by design, I'm not sure. But uh, those two complement each other in the overall assessment. So those are the tools we use. Is the BAS still included? 
The who? The e, uh, ETA? Yes. Yes, sir. The last question was, are the Basques from Italy or from uh, Spain included? And they are included. Yes, sir. Uh, yes and no. The question was, are we taking folks to other countries, uh, and is that illegal in their prisons that we control, that we pick up? Is that illegal, and are we still doing it? The answer is, it, it's illegal now, and no, we're not doing it anymore. You know what? Uh, that's why I tried to explain earlier on. We had a very uncertain time post 9-11. A lot of folks can say, hey, that's logically illegal. And other folks say, well, not necessarily. So we had some gray area there that, frankly, we probably uh, used to our counterterrorism security uh, support. Yes, sir, way back there. The question was, is bin Laden still alive? I. Uh, <clears throat> He's been marginalized. We're not sure where he's at. We speculate he might be in uh, the, un, the uh, Fatah area of Pakistan, but there are other places that, that he might be at. He's been marginalized, unfortunately, by virtue of his media committee, he's still pretty effective. And uh, his picture comes out, I think the last one, or video was, video, uh, uh, DVD was out, uh, I think the last full one was about two years ago. Um, his ability to control and to generate actions against the United States, we assess as marginal. Because he has, to, for his own survival, he has become so detached that he is um, slow and can't get the decision makers around that he wants and can't get the executors, the, the folks, the operators close to him to execute his plan. So we think he's been marginalized. Is he a target and is he a goal? Absolutely. Did we get Noria, uh, uh, Manuel Noriega? Yeah, and after a little bit of time. Did we get Abu Abbas? You may remember him, PLO, way back in the 80s? Yeah, we got him. So we may not get him right now. His influence may wane, but we'll eventually get him. And more likely, we'll get him through the assistance with the host nation somewhere around the world, given the tidbit of intelligence here that we pass with great regularity now amongst uh, uh, countries with regards to uh, terrorism. So, um, we'll get them. Yes, ma'am. Certainly. How do we, uh, how will we affect our relationship with Pakistan with, with all the activities taking place here in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and, and then uh, maybe some of the notorious media presented activities too? First of all, Pakistan has a democratic government now, and we stood by it. We stood by Benazir Bhutto before she came in, and we encouraged a peaceful uh, democratic government to go in place. It is, and it's fragile, and it's a coalition. And we want to try and support them without becoming so pretentious that uh, it uh, becomes an aggressive American uh, cry. Um, I have a counterpart in my Pakistan arena. We have uh, periodic bilateral sessions. The Pakistani ambassador to the United States was just in my office uh, last week. I'm going to see him tomorrow, ideally, between 9 o'clock and 9.30. They get it. They understand it's no longer a U.S. war. The folks in Pakistan, the terrorists in Pakistan, excuse me, the terrorists in Pakistan have lashed out against the Pakistan people. Those 80 that I mentioned to you earlier that have been killed in the streets were innocent. Pakistan government realizes that. So they have initiated military operations in the area up north called Bajur. They've had uh, 25 uh, or 75 fatalities. There's been about 100 civilian fatalities. They've got about 100,000 uh, 100, individuals who have been displaced. It's tough combat operations. The new leadership in the military said, we won't do that until we have the support of the people. And they can use governments in the past, democratic governments in the past, that have not had the support of the people. Either the government came down or the military was rejected. So this military said, we need the people with us. People have been with them during that time frame. So we're encouraged by what we see. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. They're probably not going as fast as we'd like. 
But this new government has taken this new gov Pakistan government has taken that on. It's been pretty successful. So let me get over over there, please. How supportive is the Saudi Arabian government in fighting the war on terror? Well, 2004 they got very supportive because they got attacked, and uh, they had leadership attack. They had their infra uh, energy infrastructure attack, and they had uh, U.S. Uh, forces or U.S. personnel attack there. And so they, they realized that now they're a target, and they got pretty serious. They cleaned up the al-Qaeda threat inside their country pretty well. They've gone after inside their country the hearts and minds very, very well. They've got probably the world's best de-radicalization, anti-radicalization program. It is good. It's used around the world. Probably where they're not doing what we like them to do is that uh, we have asked them to exert control on the flow of money out of their country into other countries, usually through the charity process that uh, had the potential to fund in other countries uh, uh, violent extremism. Uh, they've established a charity commission for their internal, based on our request and their realization they needed to do it. And we've asked them to do the same thing external. They haven't moved as fast as we'd like. All the way, way in back there, yes, ma'am. Uh, the question was, what do I mean by religious reform in these countries? And are, are, I think, are we encroaching on their, their history, their mores, their, the, the essence of their life? I, I probably use the wrong word. What we're trying to do is limit uh, religious persecution. And you have to be very careful if you want to come in and reform someone's religion. As we know in the United States, it would have a rough go. Uh, but persecution. Uh, which is the term I meant to use when I said, you're right, I said reform, but that was a mistake. Religious persecution, there are, there are some foundations because sometimes it's violent and it gets into the press, so we can use that. And we've got uh, in the State Department a whole office of uh, democracy, human rights, and aspects that look at that on the, on the global perspective. And we go and we solicit those countries to try and stay away from it. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, uh, who and when will we deal with Iranians in an attempt to uh, control their nuclear weapons? Kind of a little bit out of my ball, uh, ballpark, because that's, that's raw nonproliferation. I'm in the counterterrorism arena, but I can, I can give you what I think is a, a pretty informed answer. The United States encouraged multilateral influence on Iran to uh, curtail its uh, program. That government didn't respond very well. So we went through numerous other forums to uh, isolate them economically, politically, diplomatically, and in numerous other ways. Those have turned out to be pretty successful. We've gotten three UN Security Council resolutions through with, with some teeth. Um, our treasury activity, I think I mentioned earlier in today, has now gone after several more of their banks who are going after their money. Um, this non-lethal, non-kinetic effort, economic pressure, uh, in the past has proven to be pretty persuasive and pretty successful. Um, we don't know if it will be that good with Iran, but we have to start it and get our heart into it if we want international support later on, if this economic and diplomatic effort doesn't, doesn't work. So we're probably premature in doing uh, kinetic or lethal activity uh, with Iran right now. So I think you're seeing a, a deliberate process that has to start with uh, good diplomacy and, and economic sanctions. That's probably not the answer you wanted, but I can't change that. Part. Yes, sir. Sure. The question was, uh, uh, do we, are, uh, is Daly comfortable now with the amount of coordination amongst our departments and cabinet officials with regards to counterterrorism so we don't repeat a 9-11 situation? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, this organization I mentioned to you before looks at domestic and international threat every week. We do at our higher level. Three times a day, 
we have video teleconferencing amongst all the interagency elements. These are the rear workers, not the political folks, but the folks who see this particular signal intercept in a country and marry it up with a human report that took place in a third country or a second country. That business takes place every day, three times a day, seven days a week, that didn't take place before 9-11. The establishment, now this is, I don't want to scare you away, but you know, in the democracy to solve a problem, you, you slam in a bureaucratic solution, and we established this thing called the National Counterterrorism Center. It brings together the intelligence reports domestically and internationally at, in its uh, bowels of its uh, building, 31 separate agencies, not, not including any state or local, which are also part of it, but not directly there. We didn't have that before. Most of that is electronically connected. It's not manual anymore. For a while after 9-11, when this organization was set up, it was manual. Now, a lot of it's electronic. Um, the best example of <clears throat> how we would not repeat it again, it was cited in the 9-11, is I, as I believe there was an FBI agent in Arizona that picked up on terrorists flying airplanes that didn't want to land. And there's another agent up in Minnesota that picked up the same thing. And then we had a disconnected watch list with the CIA that had several of the uh, 19 uh, bombers' names on that we let into the United States. And then we had a lousy enforcement system for people who violated their visas. Uh, I can say now that if we took that situation and put it inside our new uh, efforts, it would be picked up immediately. FBI would be talking to itself laterally. Uh, FBI and CIA would be talking to itself uh, laterally or to themselves uh, laterally or horizontally, and we'd, we'd have picked it up, which is one of the early, early questions I asked when I came in, to, where are we in repairing some of the things from the 9-11 uh, uh, disaster? Yes, sir? It's uh, when you go through uh, airport uh, locations, uh, your name uh, cues the watch list, and, uh, and it's Bob Jones, and why is that the case, and can I get off the list? That's one electronic solution we haven't gotten to yet. Frankly, it's worse with our uh, international friends than it is in the domestic vein. I, I'm sympathetic to your situation, but we literally antagonize some of our international friends because their names are on the list. We can't get it off, and their names are so close to real live terror. So uh, it's, a, it's a valid complaint. Uh, DHS is working, and is working on trying to prevent that. Uh, and I can't give you much more other than my, my deputy goes into secondary when he goes through because his name keys uh, on occasion. <laughs> One of my deputies. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. The question is, uh, how do we get into the uh, into the internets on the international basis and use that information that that has a potential being uh, useful for counterterrorism? Uh, those countries give us access. Some of those ISPs are friendly enough that they're overseas that uh, would give us access. Um, there is good, solid, old intelligence work. People look over someone's shoulder and get the uh, password, and they put it into the intelligence arena, and then you can, if you think that is some type of uh, threatening uh, situation at an international scale, you can uh, use good old human intelligence from uh, agents. But, but really, I know you don't want me to answer this, the domestic side, but that's where most of the ISPs are, are in the United States or in countries that are protected through uh, individual rights and privacy. And we respect that. And Counterterrorism uh, discussions, communications, and whatnot zip through Wichita, Kansas, or uh, or Topeka, and, uh, and we we don't go after them unless we find out that there is this terrorist nexus overseas. Based on our adjusted uh, surveillance rules, we now can, and it happens to be a, a U.S. citizen, we now can. Can these drop and surveil? And there's some legal t uh, concerns there that are uh, that we try and respect. And after a certain amount of time, if nothing came in front, we purge it so it's not indefinite information, as I recall. So we have a little bit of protection there. Uh, it's it is because of signal intercepts, the electronic eavesdropping, 
both cell phone and internet is probably today our best form of intelligence uh, on the international arena. If you look at your watch, Frank, am I still good? He said, Frank said 50 more minutes. <laughs> I, I, here's, my, here's my commitment to you. If I have a, a, a question that I can't, oh, the question is uh, Pakistan uh, just passed a law recently that uh, gave the death sentence for uh, cyber terrorism. I, I can't answer that because I'm unfamiliar with what's been passed. It seems to me it might be a little radical. unless it's got, you know, some pretty uh, in, or, uh, revealing information. Oh. Yes, ma'am. The, the question is uh, both for the IRA and uh, Hezbollah. Um, how, how do we monitor them? And are they, they doing uh, uh, terrorism and are they below our radar screen? And the, the, the comment was by virtue of people moving maybe through Mexico into the United States. Hezbollah is on our uh, foreign terrorist organization list, uh, one of 44 countries. Uh, as you know, it's, got, it's very active in the, uh, in the Middle East. It's got, uh, uh, golly, I'm not sure what the percentage is in the Lebanese government. Hezbollah folks have been elected or, no, been moved in there. I'm confused with the Hamas. Um, Hezbollah is supported uh, actively by Syria and then also actively by, by Iran. Um, and those two countries are state sponsors of terrorism we have so designated. So we think for the primary aspects of how Hezbollah is doing its raw kinetic terrorism, we have a pretty good understanding and feel for it. But it's also a charity organization. It's got uh, connections around the world. And in many countries, we see that as charity. Uh, watch closely by the host nation and uh, the United States in most cases uh, to make sure that they stay legal organizations. We do not have a trend. There is some potential anecdotal information that says uh, Hezbollah comes into the Venezuela area. There's a, you know, a, a, a direct flight from Tehran to Caracas, and they work their way into the Central America up through Mexico and the United States. We don't have, we don't see that as an intelligence trend at all. It's a possibility, and it's a possibility because Hezbollah jump on the train of drugs and drug smugglers, when they don't care who goes through, they'll move them along until recently. And the drug folks don't want to move terrorists because that brings a lot of, uh, of uh, government scrutiny on them. So we, within legal constraints, they are being observed. They uh, are, from what we can tell, inside uh, the norms, uh, but it's a challenge because it's a pretty, extensive uh, network. I think I got one question left. The IRA has a question. Yeah, all right, and then we'll go, let's talk about reconciliation and political integration. Uh, our preference is exactly that for a terrorist organization, reconciliation, political integration. IRA, our IRA is moving that direction. Um, I'm not sure how far along it's, it, they are. They, um, uh, now, I better, not, I better not say I'll be speculating there. But you don't see any cooperation between certain parties still, Palestinian IRA and Hezbollah? Um, between, uh, the question is, do we see any cooperation between Hezbollah and IRA? Are you you're saying between the two of them or just out to other locations? I'm saying between the two of them. We have, I, have, I have not. Yeah. Yes, sir, last question. The question is, what are we doing to prevent uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction? There's a pretty uh, strong uh, structure inside State Department, inside CIA, inside the Department of Defense, inside FBI, sp specifically for what we call WMDT, WMD terrorism. Uh, there are several international protocols uh, against that, and our, our effort is to focus on the nuclear part because it is so devastating. The advantage is it's so complex that it's, it's, it's tough to pull off. 
except one aspect, and that's a radiological dirty bomb that could just go into a city in a container and just take 44 years to uncool. Um, we have disseminated through the uh, Department of Homeland Security assistance to nations around the world to check for radiological and nuclear devices moving through the commercial world. Um, we have officers in many of the large ports around the world where we check there before they end up here. Um, chemical and biological is another part of the WMD part. The, uh, we, we have a pretty good system in the United States. When the anthrax uh, events unfolded uh, uh, four or five years ago, because of our centralized health care system through CDCs, Center for Disease Control in, uh, Control in Atlanta, we got some early reports, and they didn't jive. And our medical care system is very advanced and very mature and very interconnected. And we were able to control that particular CBR or uh, anthrax uh, uh, event uh, probably better than whoever did it to us thought we could. It wasn't perfect. I think we had uh, seven to ten fatalities and, and a lot of sick folks, and there's a lot of disruption. But in the scheme of things, for an unprepared country to be attacked like that in the biological side, we were probably pretty successful. We've been even more successful since then from pandemic preparation. Uh, CDCs has exercises and whatnot. So in the WMDT arena, the United States is probably pretty well prepared. I go to uh, 20 or 12 countries a year. WMDT is a point of discussion with those countries, and we bring bioterrorist experts, radiological experts, and other folks to help the countries that are interested in being assisted. It has been my pleasure. Thank you very much. I'll do the obvious and thank our guests for a marvelous evening. The fact we we didn't tell the fact that so many of you yeah. paid attention and were asking questions till the end indicates the degree of appreciation. I didn't test that by waiting to the wee hours of the morning as our guests <laughs> offered. Thank you so much.